And so in the next 20 pages of Heidegger's contributions, um, they are mostly taken up with a discussion of what he calls inceptual thinking. On uh, Fangliche Denken, inceptual thinking, the thinking of the beginning, um, which is a type of thinking that is decidedly not the thinking of the sciences or the traditional metaphysical thinking of philosophy in terms of the correctness of an assertion. This isn't the type of thinking, and that, of course, uh, thinking in terms of the correctness of an assertion that begins with Aristotelian logic becomes the basis for mathematics and the mathematical principle in general, which then leads to the understanding of the metaphysics of presence as purely objective entities, um, and that leads to the enframing of the earth in terms of unconcealing these entities as not beings. Uh, science unconceals entities in the kind of clearing that it opens up, and it opens up its own uh, clearing. Um, it unconceals them in terms of their usefulness, and only in terms of their usefulness, and in doing so, essentially unconceals them as not beings. When uh, the decisive essence of a being becomes uh, that about which a being is only good for its usefulness, for its utilitarianism, you've essentially degraded being. You've, you've not only made the mistake of identifying being with beings as objective facts, but you've also degraded being to the status of a merely uh, useful entity. So it essentially is unconcealed as a not being. And this is the problem that Heidegger has with science, is that the type of clearing that it opens up is the type of it is the it is the only valid clearing that science assumes is valid. And the type of thinking that goes along with that is racist and native thinking or traditional metaphysical thinking in terms of the truth of an assertion. But inceptual thinking is not that kind of thinking at all. Um, as he talks about here in section 20, the beginning and in inceptual thinking. And he's talking about the beginning. Conceptual thinking is not, and also we should say it's not thinking in terms of a kind of Marxist-Lenin what is to be done agenda with a plan that's laid out with distinct steps, with distinct goals uh, that have to be accomplished in timely fashion, one goal leading to, uh, that is accomplished leading to the accomplishment of the next. It's not the doing and thinking in terms of a plan or an agenda. It's not that type of thinking either, as he makes clear, I think, in section, uh, section 21, where inceptual thinking, inceptual thinking is the kind of thinking, um, it's a little bit like the distinction that Spangler makes in The Decline of the West when he talks about uh, physiognomic tact in opposition to the systematic. Um, this isn't systematic thinking at all. This is the systematic thinking, as he says, is the outcome of mathematical thinking in the broadest possible sense uh, that has its own kind of rigor and logic. Um, and sexual thinking has a rigor too, but it isn't the rigor of first one thing, then another linearity. It's the rigor of the way the joinings fit together. There's a certain rigor in the way that they fit together that conceptual thinking is concerned with. And the type of thinking that is involved in conceptual thinking uh, is the type of thinking, it's, it's not uh, the type of thing, and once again to characterize it by what it is not, it's not the type of thinking of the hustle and bustle of the modern world cities, which in Heidegger's time uh, was the realm of the first automobiles and, and electric trams and trolley cars dinging and resounding, uh, maybe the first couple of airplanes are up making noise in the sky and trains are off in the horizon. All that kind of hustle and bustle leads to a kind of thinking that demands results. And it's a kind of thinking that demands uh, that any kind of thinking is only worthwhile which produces effective actual results in the actual physical world. Any other kind of thinking that doesn't produce effectual active results in the real concrete physical world, the realm of actual entities, is dismissed as useless. And so the type of thinking, of conceptual thinking, which is also the thinking in terms of a questioning of, of things, is the thinking of the Heideggerian black forest. It's the thinking of the farmer in the woods sowing the seeds and patiently waiting for them to come up and sprout. It's the type of thinking that involves things that are in a slow process of gradual metamorphosis. The seasons come around, uh, summer inevitably turns into winter, uh, the day turns into night. Everything, there's always something happening in nature. Never is it the case that it is static. There is always metamorphosis and transformation going on but it's happening at its own pace. And that is the pace that Heidegger is trying to recapture with this kind of conceptual thinking that is linked with the disposition of this other beginning as restraint, as hesitation, and as questioning. Not the type of questioning of a, that leads to immediate results and produces immediate agendas with immediate uh, projectings in the sense of projects 
uh, not in the sense of the projecting opening that he's talking about here. Uh, conceptual thinking is the kind of thinking that does what he calls a projecting opening into the clearing. That is to say, it, it opens up a time space within the clearing in which being can then proceed toward its proper process of unconcealment and the artist or the craftsman or whoever can then proceed to, to the sheltering of truth, of preserving the essence of truth by constructing culture forms that allow things to be what they are in their essence and to shine forth as they are. There's a kind of releasement or gelassenheit involved in this, in this type of letting be of things uh, that is linked with this conceptual thinking. It's a thinking that does not get immediate results. It does not get immediate answers. And so uh, the man of the city doesn't have the patience for this kind of thinking. It's a thinking that works its way by feeling in the dark along passages. Your, your Heidegger is definitely on a path. He's gone his own way into the forest here, and he's on his own path. And this book is a sort of report uh, to you, the reader, of what he is finding on this path that is other than that of the understanding of being as machination or in framing. Machination is the word that he uses in this text for what he will later term in framing, the technological understanding of being as unconcealing entities as not beings. Um, <clears throat> so that's inceptual thinking and that's projection. And uh, he's talking here about inceptual thinking is also something that goes back to the first beginning. Um, and the first beginning in a certain sense is then repeated and he says only that which is solely unique can be repeated again in the other beginning. And so inceptual thinking is inceptual because it's inaugurating, it's preparing the path for the other beginning that will be an other way of uncovering of beings than the scientific way. It will be a way of uncovering beings in a way that is spiritual and authentic. And you're sort of, uh, the ones to come, the future ones are preparing the way for the last God. And I think the last God for Heidegger is a kind of, uh, it's a kind of, advent of a new way of being, uh, a way of unconcealing entities that does not reduce them to not beings. It's a new way of unconcealing entities that retains that, that retains their spiritual essence. The last God is the sort of um, uh, an almost post-religious understanding of spirituality that the last God will, will come in and, and bring about. But the inceptual thinking is necessary to prepare the way because it's a patient, slow, gradual questioning, using restraint that waits patiently for answers and is actually more interested in in poking around with the right questions than in getting immediate answers and results, the way the scientist always wants data and always wants information and always wants immediate reports, immediate data, immediate this, immediate that. Conceptual thinking doesn't do that. It questions along the way, and the questioning itself is the goal of what it's doing in preparing a clearing, a, a new temporal spatial projecting opening in the clearing that will shelter truth in a new way uh, in ways in which poets and artists will come in and shelter truth by creating new vessels for truth, for being, uh, for being historical thinking in these works of art that they create in this new clearing that conceptual thinking will then open up. Uh, I also want to draw your attention to the fact that on page uh, 51 he, um, he talks about conceptual thinking in terms of a kind of fourfold. Now later he comes up with the, his famous fourfold, his famous redefinition of world as fourfold in terms of earth and sky, mortals and divinities. Um, and we can see, as I was saying last time, we, we can see the transformation of the strife between earth and world that he first inaugurates in the Origin of Work of Art first version in 1935. Uh, this text, I think we can already see it transforming into the later redefinition of the world as a fourfold of earth and sky, mortals and divinities to become that fourfold. Um, and in a certain sense, I think what happens there, the dynamics of, of that transformation are that uh, what really happens is that earth separates out into sky so that sky is a, a cleavage or a fissure that separates out from earth and both of those represent the principle of nature. World then separates out into the two principles of mortals on the one hand and divinities, divinities on the other which comprise the realm of human culture. Mortals and divinities construct human culture and the new definition of world as a fourfold is actually then a seamless integration of nature and culture whereas uh, let's say in earlier texts like uh, the metaphysical concepts of philosophy, world finitude, solitude, where he's talking about what differentiates the human from animals uh, and plants and stones is that uh, in the first case, the stone is worldless. It does not have a world. In the second case, animals and plants are poor in world. Their, their world, their umwelt is, is very poor in world, whereas the human being is that which creates world through language and world there has a cultural connotation uh, that does not really include nature. 
in the redefinition of world later on with the fourfold, now nature and culture are integrated in a seamless way, and they come out of this transformation of being as a ragnus, because with being as a ragnus, what happens is that Dasein is appropriated to being, and as it's appropriated to being, it's essentially aligned with being, and being then institutes new sense-making practices that enable Dasein to behave and act and be in the world in certain new transformed ways. And not only that, but um, it links Dasein, or, or rather grounds and founds Dasein in a particular there. That is to say, in a particular place, a particular dwelling, a particular home that grounds the Da, the there of Dasein, which is why Dasein is hyphenated now in this book, is this emphasis on grounding in a particular place by this appropriation, this truth event. And that later leads to his redefinition <clears throat> of, uh, of world as place and dwelling and the human dwelling and the fourfold and all of that and the authenticity of all this. So the, all that comes out of this. There's another fourfold here that uh, he's talking about in this section 27 on conceptual thinking where he says conceptual thinking is the original carrying out of resonating, interplay, leap, and grounding in their unity. Those are four terms there and they essentially constitute a mandala, uh, a fourfold. Um, the only two terms of the six joinings that are left out are the future ones and the last god, but that those are linked with Heidegger's future eschatology of the end of history by paradoxically moving into a new beginning. Here we have, we can see that the joinings in the book and the essence of the sort of rigor and logic of inceptual thinking is uh, is not causal thinking and it's not thinking in linear sequence, the, linear, the kind of sequence that's used to solve a geometric proof. It's the kind of feeling for the joinings and how they fit together. And here they fit together in terms of this fourfold where we can see, I think, that the resonating, which is translated in the in the previous Imad and Mali translation as echo, and that means the, the echo of being from the first age, the first epoch as it comes all the, as it has come all the way down to the transitional age here. So that resonating, that echo, and it has a temporal connotation, which is in opposition, I think, to interplay. And interplay means the rubbing up of the two ages, the first beginning and the second beginning. Uh, through conceptual thinking, they, they are rubbed up against each other such that um, the other beginning isn't just a repetition of the first beginning, it's it's an, the other beginning by going back to the first beginning, except on a higher turn of the spiral, like a Hegelian Alphibang, rather than a Nietzschean eternal recurrence of the same. It's transformed anew into a new epoch with new dispositions and new concerns that are motivated more by shock and awe and terror than they are by wonder. It's, it's, a, it's a much more anxious beginning than uh, the attitude of the first beginning. And that too has a temporal historical connotation. So both of those, the resonating in opposition to the interplay, have a temporal connotation, whereas the leap and the grounding have kind of spatial connotations. The leap is, of course, the leap into the truth of being that is achieved by this kind of inceptual thinking. Uh, and a leap is, of course, the image of moving off the ground, that, although it, it's not really spatial. It's just It just means a sudden creative mutation into a new understanding of being as a new set of practices of intelligibility that light up entities in the clearing in a new and fresh way in opposition to grounding. And grounding, of course, means being on the ground. It, it, the grounding is the grounding in the da of the between. Dasein becomes the between that maintains the ontological difference, the tension of the ontological difference, difference that separates mortals from divinities, and becomes the there of the clearing where the truth event happens as an unconcealing. So we can already see that for him, conceptual thinking it already has its own fourfold, and that there is a fourfold in this book, as there's a later fourfold, resonating versus interplay, leap versus grounding, and they fit together in a way that isn't logical, but is rigorous nonetheless. It's the rigor of the physiognomic tact that the artist or the poet has, or even the cabinet maker who has uh, a sense for the, the different types of wood. He knows what wood has the right contours so that he can set the wood back and let it be as it wants to be in its authenticity through creating it as something that is authentic that lets that wood shine forth in the way that's proper to the essence of that particular kind of wood. He has to be able to recognize that. And so the conceptual thinker is one who, who has a feel for these, these metaphysical problems and issues and is preparing the way uh, for the other beginning that is to come. Uh, so we'll stop there for that audio file.